is not only okay right Matthew chapter 9 we're going to start in verse 18 in just a moment we'll give you a little time uh, to find your place there as well as Mark 5 and uh, Luke chapter um, Luke chapter 8 these uh, different uh, recordings uh, documentation of these different same of these same uh, miracles these same incidences are recorded more than once of course um, so that we can see different details in from a different perspective and um, they are very helpful to us to read and to consider all the passages that deal with the very same incident um, and so uh, we're going to do that this morning uh, we uh, need to remind ourselves that these miracles not only show the compassion the great care and concern uh, for uh, the human race that God has. It'll also show his infinite wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that he knows about their pain, about their suffering. He cares. That's very clear in all of this. And he's more than able to uh, address these situations and to heal these folks, uh, to work in their lives, to bring them to a place of salvation by grace through faith. And so that's what we're seeing right before our eyes. It also shows, ultimately too, that He is God in the flesh, that He is the Messiah, He is the Savior. We use the term deity, it just means that He is God. And um, we want to never forget that, ever. And so, if you're able, out of respect for the reading of God's Word, would you stand with me please? Uh, and then we will read starting in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 18 and we will read all the way through verse 26 if you would with me please so I will read out loud if you will follow along silently here we go while he spake these things unto them behold there came a certain ruler and worshiped him saying my daughter is even now dead but come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live and Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. And Jesus turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame thereof, uh, hereof went abroad into all that land. Wow, what a powerful story. We have these two miracles taking place. And God clearly intends for them to be considered together. They not only have value in each, each one of these healings and the account and the details for the woman uh, that had an issue of blood 12 years and the young girl uh, who was raised from the dead, but together they have some principles that we need to learn when we consider them overall. And so we're going to be looking at the details as well as the big picture uh, this morning. And I'm really trusting and praying that God will do a great work in our hearts as a result of that. But if you would, if you wouldn't mind, let's just bow our heads right now and pray and ask God's blessing, and then we'll have you seated. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for coming before us, allowing us actually to come before you. And we are uh, most uh, privileged and honored to be here in your presence. We know that we don't deserve it, but we believe with all our hearts as you commanded us uh, to assemble and to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, uh, that you have a, a purpose, you have a reason for us gathering, and that is to exalt you, uh, to glorify you, to lift up your name, uh, to praise you with everything you give us and allow us to have to praise you with uh, in our entire being. And I just pray that we would get what you're saying today, that you would teach us what you know uh, happened during these uh, two
two occurrences and any others we consider beyond this. And we pray that you'd get the honor and the glory for it, that we would be built up in the faith, that we would uh, be all the more in awe of you, that souls would be saved and lives changed, especially if there's anybody here today that does not know you. I pray that today would be the day they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And be seated if you would, please. So I want to talk to you this morning about in regards to uh, Jairus, who is this ruler, uh, no doubt a ruler of the Jews, uh, more specifically probably a ruler in the synagogue there in Jerusalem, and his home. It's a broken home. It's a broken home because as he came to Jesus, he explained to him that the daughter was very near to death. And you'll see that when we read over in Mark and Luke, this statement will be made that his daughter is actually dead. Um, we see then, because of the condition of Jairus' daughter, and it's not just Jairus' daughter, but his wife, the mother of this young girl, um, is greatly, uh, are both greatly distressed over their daughter, and we'll bring out how we can tell that um, with more details in a moment. But we understand that um, she dies before Jesus can get there. And then we consider the issue of, and, and remember that the young lady, we will see it's not said here, but when we consider the other passages, you'll see that she's 12 years old. And then we see this uh, dear lady who's been dealing with an issue of blood 12 years. Literally, we understand that in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible says, the life of the flesh is in the, what does it say, class? In the blood. So if she's got an issue of blood, literally, her life is ebbing and flowing away from her every day for 12 years. She is greatly weakened, greatly distressed, no doubt in despair for having gone through this for 12 years. And the little girl is 12 years old. We'll do some comparison and some contrasting um, through the course of this message. You'll see some of these things coming out and how important it is for each, for the Lord to teach us some things, again, as I mentioned before, um, with each individual incident, but with both incidences as we see them combined and see the big picture. As we get into this, we find hers, his and Mrs. Jairus, uh, they had a broken home. Uh, their daughter died. Their home was broken. It was damaged greatly. We see this dear lady had a broken hope. 12 years, 12 years she had put up with this. For her, pretty much hope was gone. As far as she concerned it was until she heard of Jesus. And that was a broken home until Jesus came into that home and see the healing that God did in a, just a powerful way. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard me say this even recently down at Victory Baptist. Uh, within the last couple of Sundays, but I'll say it again here, and I've said it here many times before, but understand that the Word of God was not written so we can only see what happened in the past. It was written also that what we could see that Jesus still does and that God still does, not just what He did. We do need to find out what He did, but it's, it's a book of hope because Christ is our hope. He's a living Savior. He's not dead. So because, as 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, we've been begotten again to a lively hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's alive. You serve a risen Savior. So that means your hope is alive. All right, let's get into this. As we see this, it starts out just with Jairus coming to Jesus you see that he is still seated in Matthew's house, still talking about the new wine, uh, um, 
recommending uh, and them that they not put it in old bottles and the truth of how the grace and the law just don't go together. The new gar or the new cloth being sewn into an old garment and how the rent is made worse and uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not fit uh, with the law. Uh, they're polar opposites and it just makes the whole worse when you try to combine the two. So we got those truths the last time we met in the book of Matthew. Um, but he's still in the book of Matt, excuse me, he's still in Matthew's house. He says, while he spake these things, verse 18 said, unto them, and there came this ruler. And then verse 19 says, and Jesus arose and followed him, followed Jairus back to his house, and so did his disciples. So now you have the picture here that the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ follow him out of Matthew's house, along with uh, the whole group following Jairus back to his home. They're still in the city of Capernaum, uh, where a great many miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ took place. And that city saw the witness of those miracles. And therefore, because they saw more miracles than any city in the New Testament, in any location in the New Testament, they are more accountable. To whom, finish this for me, class. To whom much is given, much is required. Exactly. And so we are accountable for the knowledge we have and the experience we have with Christ and what we know He's done in our lives. And the more He does, the more accountable we are, but the more glory God gets and the more able He's uh, to use us uh, for His honor and glory. But let's get into this. It was very difficult for Jesus, or excuse me, Jairus, to probably come to Jesus. He's a, he's a ruler of the Jews, a ruler in the synagogue, and uh, everything around him, in the environment around, in those um, of his peers who were uh, 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 very faithful to the synagogue and listening to uh, Jairus' teaching and watching his leadership and knowing the position he had where he was more exposed than the average person uh, that would attend the uh, synagogue because of his leadership role as a ruler in that synagogue. Yet, when it, come to, when it came to his daughter dying, he didn't care about the peer pressure. He didn't care about what others said. That was his daughter that was dying. Let's um, flip over to Mark chapter 5 real quick. Let me show you something about that. And even when we leave Mark chapter 5, hold your place because, Lord willing, we'll be back there. Okay? All right. It says, in, in other words, in verse 22, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, that's Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, our other passage in Matthew said he worshipped him. So you see he got down on his knees, probably bowed his head and his entire torso and his hands to the ground um, in worship of the Lord Jesus, acknowledging him for who he, who he was. All right. Verse 23, And he sought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, and that she may be healed, and she shall live. And then Jesus went with it. And then all of a sudden, we see, in, and it says, And the people followed him and thronged him. So you get the idea. This is very important. Every detail in the Word of God is important, or God wouldn't have put it in there. When he's following Jairus, it gets to the point where not only his disciples followed him, but the people began to follow him, and they thronged him. They got so close, they were crowded around him, probably helping usher him physically uh, on that path, following Jairus, getting all around him, coming in contact with him, physical contact with him all along the way. And then it says in verse 25, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and has suffered many things of many physicians, and has spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. So she has spent every dime she had in those 12 years to pay physicians, doctors, to help her. And the Bible says as a result, she was not only not improved, not bettered, but actually was worse off. But it says in verse 27, here's where things changed. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press, that is in the crowd behind them, and 
touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Glory to God. She spent all this time going to doctors, trying to get help, pursuing every avenue, every lead, every recommendation that had come her way. Spent every uh, bit of money she had to try to get better and was not better. For 12 years, she went through this ceremony, this tradition, this habit. Um, uh, every time she got a chance, she'd go to a doctor, uh, hear of a new one, hear of a new cure, hear of a new idea or whatever. She'd go that way and was nothing better but only worse. After 12 years, weakened physically, weakened emotionally, just wounded all the way around. And then she hears of Jesus. I wonder how many other people may have been healed if they'd hear of Jesus. I wonder how many other people would be saved if somebody would just tell them about Jesus to where they would hear of Jesus. I wonder how many other people are suffering and they know it and are at wit's end and have run out of answers but are just waiting for somebody to tell them about Jesus. We're talking about not very far from here within Stone's Throw or even uh, outside of our ability to uh, throw a uh, stone or a softball. I remember growing up and uh, we would have these physical uh, agility tests and one of them would be to throw a softball and somebody would be at the other end to measure it and see how far you threw it. But even outside of the ability we have to throw a softball, um, there are people hurting. There are homes that are shattered, marriages hanging on by a thread, people sick of terminal diseases still without Christ, parent and child relationships all but gone, all but destroyed, work situations, uh, vocational career um, careers coming apart and falling apart, and people without work. And we could go on and on and on listing those things that cause hurt and pain and, and uh, great distress to people. But they just need to hear about Jesus. Understand this. Let me just put this in here real quick. If somebody is hurting because they're going through a divorce or a bad marriage situation and not saved, I'm here to tell you that Jesus can heal those situations. But you don't get saved because you pray and ask Jesus to heal that marriage situation. People can get sick and Jesus can heal sicknesses and disease, even terminal ones or designated terminal by, by doctors. But you don't get saved because you ask Jesus to heal you physically. He can cure job situations, financial hardships, and so on and so forth in every situation you can think of. But the only way that you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is because a person gets to the place where they realize they're a sinner headed to hell, but that Jesus is the Savior who paid for their sins. And they repent. They're remorseful. They have shame and sorrow over their sin and their sinful condition. And they come to Jesus looking to Him alone. Salvation is only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. And they come to Him alone, repenting of those sins and realizing that their destiny is the lake of fire. And come and ask for forgiveness of those sins and ask for eternal life. And they will get it every time. Every time. But you don't go to heaven and get saved and are born again because you're asking Jesus to heal you of this other situation that is dire, that is difficult, that is tragic maybe sometimes. So when you're helping people and deliver, helping people come to know Christ, try to discern the difference in what they're really praying for and what's really... Um, uh, their their uh, uh, eyes are upon 
of Jesus for. It's very, very important that we get that. So we come to this place and we find that this lady has heard of Jesus. We're told elsewhere in the other passage that she touched the hem of his garment. A big thing here is that Jesus, no doubt, was obedient to the law. The Bible says he came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. And can I hear an amen with that? So if he was fulfilling the law, then on the bottom of his outward clothing, the hem was full of blue tassels all the way around. That was commanded over in Numbers chapter 15 and Deuteronomy 22 that if that man was being obedient to the Lord and was a person who was determined to please the Lord and again be obedient to Him, he was going to dress in that fashion. And so therefore Jesus had those on, their, on the hem of His garment. So did the Pharisees, but the Pharisees were told made broad their phylacteries, made broad their garments. They would put more fabric into their outer clothing so that the hem would be much larger. And if you stretch it out, it'd have a much greater circumference and there would be much more blue showing just to show how spiritual they were. Just to show something on the outside. But spirituality wasn't isn't on the outside. It should show on the outside. It, it, it should reflect what's in your heart and your walk with Christ will reflect on the outside by your behavior, by your clothing, by everything it will. But the fact of the matter is all they had was their pomp. Talking about the Pharisees. Whereas Jesus had power. And this lady touched his garment reached as far as she could. I don't know that she intended on having the goal of just touching the hem of his garment, but that's what she ended up touching, perhaps reaching out through the crowd as far as she could with her arm and her hand and be able to grasp and his garment and just got a hold of the hem of his garment. That's as close as she got. And immediately the power of Christ by her faith came through and healed her of that issue of blood that she had had for 12 years. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him and turned him about in the press and who said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, thou, say, thou, thou seest that the multitude thronging thee and thou sayest, who touched me? Then he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. What a glorious thing took place in this lady's life. And of course, it wasn't a miracle that everyone could see. It was very private. It was very confidential just between her and her doctors. Maybe some of her closest friends and relatives. But it was a very private thing. Quite the opposite of Jairus' daughter. He was a public figure. No doubt everybody in town that knew him knew that his daughter lay dying and almost dead. And then he comes publicly. Whereas the lady didn't tell anybody when she went to Jesus. She said within herself, if I could just touch his garment, I'll be made whole. That's great faith. But Jairus, he was very open. He came right into Matthew's house where everybody was seated at the table. All of the publicans were there that had been there uh, with Jesus at that meal. All of his disciples were there. Jairus came right in boldly, but also broken and said to Jesus, if you would just come to my house, my daughter's lying at the point of death. If you could just touch her, she will be uh, made whole. She'll live. And so he arose and came. It was very public. Jesus calls this woman daughter. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, 
it says, unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. It wasn't very often during Jesus' earthly ministry that he said something or did something that clearly pointed to the fact that he is the everlasting father. But he called this young, this woman daughter. If you recall just in earlier in chapter nine, the man that was uh, sick of the palsy and paralyzed, he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Again, the second time that he called somebody as if they were his child, referring to the fact that he is the everlasting father. We go on in this passage and we see what a miracle was done on behalf of this lady through Jesus, that she was healed of her issue of blood. No longer the weakness was there and in its place strength and, and uh, she was more than happy to publicly come and testify to that. Understanding this, that Jesus called her out. He wouldn't let it remain a private thing. He said, who touched me? What did Jesus want from that? He wanted a public testimony so that everyone could hear what he had done for her. What God had done for her. What Jesus had done for her. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do not be ashamed of the name of Christ. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ in your life. You are a blood-bought born again, royal blood flowing through your veins, child of God, and God wants the world to know it. He wants your personal testimony to be just that, a personal one, a very unique one to you, but He never, ever said He wanted to be a private one. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is not to stay private. It is to be declared and um, shouted from the housetop, trumpeted, if you will, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is your Savior, that you are a child of God and unashamed of that. That's why these ladies got baptized here a few weeks ago. Uh, that's why Emily got baptized a little bit before that. And that's why all of you who have received Christ as Savior have been publicly baptized. It is not to be a secret uh, practice. It's not to be a secret event. You are to be publicly baptized after your salvation so that the whole world can know that you're unashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he wanted that testimony amongst that crowd of what he had done for that dear lady. And she came, fearing and trembling, but she spoke out and said what God had done for her. And he commended her and said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Glory, hallelujah. But we continue on that. And look what it says in verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which had said thy daughter is dead why troublest thou the master any further and and uh, um, uh, he says as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken he said uh, saith unto the ruler of the synagogue be not afraid only believe one of the other passages he tells him fear not same same thing only believe, only have faith, believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. There was at a point when he came to Jairus' house and the crowd arrived. Someone came outside when they heard them approaching the house. Maybe one of his servants, I don't know. But said, don't, don't trouble the master any further. Your daughter is dead. What a bit of bad news that Jairus received before he ever entered his house. You think maybe, what would go through your head? She's dead. 
She was at the point of death when he came to Jesus. And now she's dead. Perhaps you think he lost his hope at that point. You think it might have went through his head. If only Jesus hadn't taken the time and that lady hadn't approached him with the issue of blood, Jesus would have had time to get here and heal my daughter. You think that might have went through his head? Maybe. Quite possibly, she's human, but he's human. But here's the deal. Let me, let me go through this because I'm about ready to get ahead of myself. I'll get right back to that. Hold that thought. But he told Jairus, be not afraid, only believe when they got that news. And when they went in the house, he wouldn't let anybody come in except for Peter, James, and John, this dear man, Jairus, and then his wife who was already in the house. Everybody else, it said, he put out. And he said, he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, verse 38, and seeth the tumult, a lot of people, and them that wept and wailed greatly. You remember back in Matthew, he said when he came in, there were minstrels. It was common practice, minstrels playing musical instruments. There were also people there weeping and mourning. I don't know how long it took from the time that Jairus uh, approached Jesus in Matthew's house until he got back home to his own house. But they're in the same city, Capernaum. And whatever time had elapsed and whenever this young girl died, uh, he... Uh, um, had time, or the family had time, to hire professional mourners. It was common practice, and Jairus, being a ruler of the Jews, was of an economic, um, uh, in an economic position, financial position, to uh, hire minstrels. Maybe his wife gave the word. Maybe a, a, a grandfather, grandmother of the little girl. I don't know. Somebody gave the word, and the minstrels were able to get there. And professional mourners weeping on cue were there in the house. And Jesus, when he came in, said, there's no cause for mourning. There was no cause for this music probably being played in a minor key that sounded like a funeral dirge and depressing music. Get those guys out of here. And so they were put out of the house and when Jesus said this in verse 39, he says, And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make you this ado, this big deal, this commotion? And weep. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Now the fact of the matter is, she was dead physically. But in Jesus' mind, in his way of thinking, that didn't present a problem to him. That was no obstacle. And in his mind, she was as good as raised from the dead. And when they laughed, verse 4, him to scorn. They laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto you, I say unto thee, arise. He's, he's saying, little girl, Arise. That's what that's what Talitha and, and uh, damsel means. Means a little girl. He's a little girl. Get up off that bed. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, and for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. So here's the deal. The lady is healed. The little girl is raised from the dead. 12 years old. The lady 12 years with her um, wound, with her bleeding for 12 years. Jairus coming first and approaching him with this matter of his daughter lying at the point of death. 
there are two people with similar situations yet opposite predicaments in their lives. Both came to Jesus personally. Jairus was a leading Jewish man, a ruler of the Jews in the synagogue. She was an anonymous woman that nobody knew. Had no fame, notoriety, no popularity. No one knew her. He was a synagogue leader. But according to Jewish law, according to Old Testament law, because she had this issue of blood for 12 years, she was not allowed in the synagogue at all. Not one day in 12 years was she allowed to go to church and hear the word of God and be encouraged. Not one day in 12 years. He was there often. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He was there leading worship quite often. He knew the word of God well. Now she knew the word of God before she had this issue of blood for 12 years. She was schooled. She was educa educated from a child in the word of God. She knew the rule about her not being allowed in church and synagogue. She kept that. Jairus came pleading for his daughter. This woman came pleading for herself. The girl had been healthy for 12 years until she got this terminal illness. And then she died. The woman had been ill for 12 years and was now made whole. Jairus' need was public. Her need was private. Everyone knew about Jairus' need in the area. Only Jesus, only Jesus knew about her need her sickness, her disease. But both place their faith and trust in Jesus. And as a result, their prayers were answered. The 12-year-old girl was healed. The woman with a 12-year issue of blood was healed and made whole. He met both of their needs. One that nobody knew about but him and one that a lot of people knew about. That's your Jesus. That's my Jesus. He cares, whether it's private or public. Now, back to what we talked about before. You think maybe Jairus might have resented her a little bit when he heard that messenger came out of his house, told him that you don't bother the master anymore, which is a negative, a wet blanket on his faith in the Lord. Don't bother him anymore. Your daughter's dead. What went through his head? Man, if Jesus only would have come straight here, if that lady hadn't have wanted to be healed, we could have got here quicker. Here's what I want to point out what the scripture teaches us this morning. It's why God wants these two things together interwoven so that we understand not just the details of what he did, but the big picture. Jesus knew both situations and was more than capable of handling both of them, but it didn't mean that Jairus didn't get his faith challenged by that delay of getting to his house. In fact, God did stretch his faith by delaying that answer. God increased his faith as a result of delaying that answer. He had more faith at the end of his daughter being made whole and raised from the dead than he would have if they came straight there took longer to get there. When he approached Jesus, she was at the point of death, but now she's dead. That's a big deal. And she was healed. But not only that, but he got to see, 
he got to see this lady healed. He got to see her personal testimony, a believable testimony, of her being healed of that issue of blood for 12 years. He got to see that. He got to witness that. He got to hear her testimony. I think Jesus wanted her to give her testimony for everybody around, but most of all for Jairus. I think he needed to hear that testimony more than anybody else. He was still hurting. He was still fearful of his daughter dying and not being raised up. In this particular situation, Jesus honored that woman's faith. But here's the deal. How many others were touching Christ during that time? A lot. How many others were close to Jesus, close enough to reach out and touch his garment, if not pressing upon him, um, close to him already touching his garment? A lot of people. They came that close to Jesus, but I'm going to use the vernacular, but did not get saved with the exception of the disciples who already had their faith and trust in Christ, with the exception of any of the publicans that got saved, including Matthew, in Matthew's house. Some people get so close to Jesus, they can bump up against him, they can touch his garment, and still not be saved, still not be healed of what's ailing them, still not get the hand of Jesus on their life. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes more than just knowing that Jesus is alive, knowing that Jesus is real, and believing that he died on the cross. Do you understand this? In this day and age, in 2020 right now, I can't cite the um, website for you to go to. Um, I can think of the man's name who has accumulated this information and done the work survey-wise to prove it to be true. But 90%, literally 90% of the world's atheists, and we're talking about the foremost leading, quote, scholars, scientists, sociologists, so on and so forth, all of those big names, 90% of them believe that Jesus was real, and they believe in his death on the cross. But they deny his resurrection. They get so close. And yet if that does not change in their life, they will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Eternity. Everlasting punishment. Everlasting death. Eternity. Don't think just because somebody <clears throat> believes that Jesus is real, they go to church, maybe even own a Bible, that that makes them saved. People can get so close and yet still go to hell. How about you today? Are you really born again? Have you ever come to the place where you put your faith and trust in Christ and the truth? that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins because you are a sinner. And being repentant, being remorseful, being ashamed and sorrowful for those sins before God have come to him believing that he died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day. If you have and you have placed that faith and trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, you are saved, you are born again. Nothing is going to stop your going to heaven when you take your last breath. But if you have not, just bumping up against Christians or even uh, having a Bible and believing that Jesus is real is not going to get you to heaven. Seeing Him work in somebody else's life, if you're in that crowd, in that press, that just witnessed what He did for Jairus' daughter or witnessed what he did for that dear lady does not make you saved. But it puts you closer 
And you just must take that step of placing your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and how nothing else needs to be done. Not you or anybody else needs to do anything else except embrace the truth and acknowledge your sinful condition, but that Jesus is the Savior. Jairus benefited by that delay. His wife benefited by that delay. And God was glorified in that delay. Understand that if there's a delay in your life to an answer to prayer, God has a reason for it. He has a purpose for it. And your faith will be increased if you will. Keep your eyes on Jesus and continue to trust Him. And God will be glorified in the whole thing. There was a broken home and there was a broken hope with these two incidences here, these two events. But God brought hope. Jesus brought hope to both of them and healed them completely as He can do for you. Let's do this. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes with no one looking around. You're here today. And you say, Pastor, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I'm born again. 